Welcome, everyone, to Family Talk. It's a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute, supported by listeners just like you. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us. Welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and today's topic is one that is sensitive in nature and intended for mature audiences. We'll hear a classic program featuring our own Dr. James Dobson with his good friend, Patrick Truman. These two godly men with a heart for service will discuss the dark subject of pornography and its effects on modern society. This multi-billion dollar industry is literally stealing our children, destroying their lives, breaking up families, and has cast adrift generations of men in our country as well. Did you know that most young people are unintentionally exposed to explicit images by the time they reach the teenage years? And unfortunately, we live in a culture where television and movies glamorize sex and violence. They're hurting people in the most carnal ways, not to mention the proliferation of the Internet and social media, too. It's like a firestorm. Once these pornographic images have been viewed, they are literally seared into a person's mind. And when the brain recalls the image later, sadly, it repeats the shock and trauma initially experienced. Our guest on today's Family Talk program is Patrick Truman, the president of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. He has been in the fight for a long time, seeking to eradicate sexual abuse and exploitation from every corner of the world. Now, as you might know, in the 1980s, Dr. Dobson served on Attorney General Edwin Meese's Pornography Commission, exposing the porn industry's effects on American society. And that commission ultimately delivered the 1986 Meese Report on Pornography. At the same time, Patrick Truman was identifying some of the same information as a U.S. attorney prosecuting sex crimes against children and obscenity crimes while working at the Department of Justice. He did so from 1988 to 1993. Patrick Truman has also served as a lawyer for more than 40 years, and in 2015, he established the Law Center for the National Center on Sexual Exploitation to help uphold human rights in the courtroom. As I mentioned earlier, today's program contains mature content and is not suitable for younger listeners. Parental discretion definitely advised. And now, without further ado, I'll let Dr. Dobson explain more about his work on the Attorney General Edwin Meese Pornography Commission. One of the most difficult and disgusting things I've ever done in my life was serving on the Attorney General's Commission in Pornography. That was 1985, 1986. I didn't even know if I was going to survive that. I don't think I would have if it hadn't been for Alan Sears, who was the executive director of the commission. On the first day of the commission, we bonded, we met. And I saw what his heart was for righteousness. And the two of us were allies through this. He went on to become the founder of the Alliance Defending Freedom and has been the major pornography fighter in the entire country. I love that man, and I appreciate him today. The materials that we examined and analyzed uh, were conducted under the most terrible of circumstances. I just, uh, we heard so many uh, testimonies of victims of pornography and their families, and it broke my heart. We produced, as a result of that 18-month study, a 2,000-page report which brought about 26 changes in the law. They were signed into law by Congress and then signed by President Ronald Reagan, and I was working with him throughout that time. For a time, the clock on pornography began to run backwards, but then the Gipper left, and George Herbert Walker Bush was elected. Now, he also had a heart to fight pornography, and I'm grateful that he did, and he got his... Uh, Department of Justice to continue the work that we had started. And Herbert Walker Bush left office, and Bill Clinton defeated him, and he was elected. And he began dismantling the effort to defeat pornography 
and the industry. And the pornography industry cheered when he did. And uh, he appointed um, people to the Department of Justice who would not prosecute it. And uh, the whole thing unraveled. And the work that we did was essentially lost. And then our findings and recommendations were largely ignored. And that filth began to grow in culture. And because the Internet came in at that time, there was no stopping it. Fast forward now many years, and everywhere you look is evidence of the pornification of America. It's in the movies. You see it in magazine covers, at every grocery store, every checkout line. And you even see it in many of the fashions sold to young girls. In fact, young girls and boys are the ones exploited and damaged by it. Everywhere, there are sexualized images targeting younger and younger children. But there are many people starting to wake up to the danger that we warned about all those years ago. It has a devastating effect, especially on boys who are captured and held in addictions, uh, many of them for the rest of their life, having stumbled on this stuff on the Internet. And uh, more and more people are seeing this, more parents are seeing it in the fight to clean up images saturating the media. My guest today is Patrick Truman, who is like a brother to me. He was on the staff at the Department of Justice uh, for the Pornography Commission. That's where I met him, 1985. And uh, he's still a leader in that battle. He has not backed off one bit in all these years, and it has been a tough struggle. Patrick Truman now is president of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and you're also a lawyer. Uh, Patrick also founded the New Law Center, which is seeking to create and defend legislation to fight obscenity in the culture. He's here today to talk about some of his organization's responsibilities. And again, he was at the Department of Justice during that time that I was working there. So, Patrick, you're a lawyer who specializes in opposing this stuff. Thank you for not backing off. Thank you for giving your life's work to this cause. And uh, start by... Uh, going back to those days in 1985 and 86, what do you remember about them, and how do you feel about it today? You know, the first thing I remember about the issue of pornography was uh, a film that you produced back then, Jim, The War on Illegal Pornography. I believe that was the title? Um, it's a Winnable War. It's a Winnable War. Yeah. That's right. And I saw that film... And uh, pornography wasn't an issue with me at all. I had given my eyes over to the Lord years ago before that. But that struck me that we really have a problem in America. And then at the same time the commission was going on and I was at the Department of Justice, when the commission finished its work, it had many recommendations, but two very important recommendations were to update all those laws on pornography so we could fight the pornographers. The second one was to have a special strike force of prosecutors in the criminal division to go after the major producers and distributors. And I was asked to be the number two person in that office, and then the, the head of that office left soon thereafter, and I suddenly became the the head prosecutor at the office. Department of Justice. At the Department of Justice. And we had a big task because the pornography industry had never been prosecuted. The Justice Department hadn't done any cases in a number of years. But what we discovered when we began prosecuting, and we, we went after the biggest companies, the companies that were producing the most films and distributing them to 50 states, what we discovered in jury trials is that the juries wanted to convict because they didn't want to think that their communities 
would be overrun by this kind of material. And as part of your prosecution, you have to take into account community standards. And the yes. jury gets to say what's whether it meets their community standards or not. Juries want to say our community is better than this. And so we never lost a trial. And, you know, Jim, I think today if the Justice Department would start prosecuting again, and we know they haven't been doing it for years, I think you would have an even more receptive jury pool. Because now, as your comments, introductory comments point out, it's so devastating, it's really affecting in one way or another every family in America. Anyone who has kids, teen or older, they know about incidences with their own kids getting exposed or someone in their neighborhood, some incident at school, et cetera. And the statistics back us up on this because it shows that in uh, teen boys until you're about 24, something in the area of 90 percent are looking at pornography. Now, is this what parents want? Of course not. And it's like 60 percent of the girls. And it's, it's really difficult to treat. Once you're addicted to this stuff, you are hooked and maybe for life. And the problem that we hear is that the husband is hooked on it and the wife is not. And she's offended by it and he wants her to do things she won't do. And it destroys the sexual relationship for the marriage. Right, and he thinks she's not beautiful. Because he's looking yeah. at, you know, an 18 Perfection. Year old. He's looking at, yeah, a touched up model. And uh, so it destroys marriages, but it destroys childhoods too. The problem of pornography truly has some very long term consequences. I'm Roger Marsh. Breaking into our conversation today here on Family Talk, uh, just to remind you that today's classic program features Dr. James Dobson and Patrick Truman as they discuss the problem of pornography and the porn industry. Patrick Truman is the president of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. If you'd like to learn more about him or the NCOSE, you could visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. And if any of today's conversation is moving you to pray for a situation or perhaps a person that you know who may be suffering due to the use of pornography, we are here to pray with and for you. You can reach out to us online at drjamesdobson.org or give us a call at 877-732-6825. Now, let's rejoin Patrick Truman and Dr. Dobson right now here on Family Talk. One thing we're noticing a rise in is child-on-child sex abuse. And this is not just an American phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And the only reason for the rise is the use of pornography, the exposure to pornography of young children. It's upended society. That's why we call this a public health crisis. It's not just a problem for one family or another. It's a problem for society and we can't solve it unless and we... And child pornography is very much a part of it. Of course it is, yeah. And that's been the one thing that the Department of Justice has been willing to kind of fight a little bit. Yes. Uh, they won't fight obscenity. They won't fight adult pornography, but by not fighting adult pornography, they're allowing for more child pornography because, as you know, when these people are looking at pornography, they always have to have something harder and more deviant. They keep moving towards something. And many of them turn to child pornography. Yeah, it's progressive and it is addictive. And it marches you down the road, as you said, toward harder and more violent and more uh, gross images And what uh, stimulates one day will not be enough tomorrow. There was a time when seeing just uh, stalking uh, turned a guy on. Mm -hmm. But now it goes farther and farther in the direction of the the paraphilias. That means abnormal, far out things like homosexual violence and child pornography and bestiality and all those and violence against women. That's where Ted Bundy got his addiction. He told me that the night before he died. There's a study out a few years back 
uh, Dr. Anna Bridges and her team, they looked at the top 50 most popularly sold porn films in America, and they they went scene by scene in it and discovered that 88% of the scenes in those top 50 movies depicted sexual violence against women. Yeah. Now, so when we see the sexual violence in society, we don't have to ask where it comes from. We're training young people on sexual violence. And what does it say about our society when we have such high numbers of young men looking at pornography and we know what they're looking at? Sexual violence against women. These will be our leaders. These will be our, what, our ministers, our, our uh, politicians. Uh, the pornography trains the brain. And that's what the problem is. I'm not going to try to describe what that violence looks like, but I can tell you it will turn your stomach. And we had to sit and look at that stuff and then hear from women who had been abused in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's not a victimless crime. It is sexploitation of the worst order. And it's taking place on college campuses, taking place on high school and junior high campuses now. You know, the uh, graphicness of Scripture will tell you just how evil sin is and how wicked sin is and how wicked immorality is. And it has never been more true of other forms of sin than this one because it goes to the heart of human nature and the human soul. Yes. And we, we try to talk at our organization, National Center on Sexual Exploitation, about the seamless continuum of exploitation. When we're feeding kids the sexually exploitive imagery as kids, the Cosmopolitan magazine that they see in yeah. the checkout counter and what's on television and whatnot. And then, you know, they're in grade schools and parents are giving their kids a cell phone in grade school. And they have some excuse, oh, well, you know, he needs to call me to, to make sure he gets a ride home. Or and the phone is unfiltered, but the kids are talking about sex and they look it up and they get it there. And then, you know, you're on the college campuses in the next part of your life. And pornography is on the walls. It's everywhere. And kids are experimenting. What they see, they want to do. And then, you know, they're into the military after that. Or, you know, they're trying out prostitution in numbers. College kids are. And uh, with prostitution comes sex trafficking. They don't ask whether the, the person is a traffic victim or not. So you see these seamless connection between all forms of sexual exploitation, but it's the pornography that is the glue that holds it all together. Mm. Uh, how can we put into words uh, that will help people understand how, how ubiquitous this pornography really is? I mean, it is everywhere. Someone at our one of our annual events, Dr. Gail Dines, talked about pornography as the wallpaper of our children's lives. And that's really what it is. It's, it is everywhere. And they know how to find it. Uh, kids today can use the internet to go anywhere in the world. They know how to go anywhere. And they know how to go to porn sites. And the porn industry knows that about them. So they have all these free porn sites out there. And parents may not be aware of it, but it's just unlimited amounts of free pornography in every, as you said, paraphilia, whatever you're looking for, and stuff you never knew existed. But at a young age, kids, I mean, an adult can't handle this. I wouldn't want to look at this. But at a young age, what's that mind like? that a child has or a teenager has. Men are made that way. I, I, want, I want to confess something to you, uh, Patrick, that uh, I feel I, I need to be honest about. Uh, we're all affected by it. Sure. We're all vulnerable to it. When I was a very young man, uh, Playboy and Penthouse appealed to me. And uh, I didn't buy them, but I would read them somewhere. And uh, the Lord began talking to me. Mm. Uh, I get teary-eyed about it now. The Lord cared me enough about me to say, that's not my will for you. Yeah. And uh, I made a commitment. And I said, Lord, I will not touch it again. I want to tell you how 
vicious Satan is. But I was on a plane alone, and I was married, and I was on my way back, and I'd made that commitment, and I was living with it. And someone left in the back of the seat in front of me, a brand new hustler and a brand new playboy. There it sat. Nobody would ever know if I picked it up. No one would ever condemn me. I was on the inside seat, and I didn't touch it, Pat. Good for you. I didn't touch it. And I have not picked up one since. And I tell you, that's the resolve you got to have because it'll get you. If you were looking at a congregation of a 1,000 men— How many of them do you think are addicted to pornography? Well, well over 50%. I would guess it's over 50%. Now, addicted is a term that you know people define in various ways, but let's just say this. How many have pornography in their life every day? And I'll bet it's more than 50%. I would be inclined to say it's more. More than that. I would put it at 70 and maybe 80. Yeah. And i tell you something else. We had evidence at our ministry with a hotline that pastors could call that that was the number one reason they called because they used to have to go into a a porn shop and bring something out in a brown paper bag that people would see. Now they go in their office and say, I'm working on my sermon, and they close the door. Yes, that is a big problem. The church has a problem, Jim. You know, something that to be concerned about is that most churches in America, probably 90 percent, if a man is, has a pornography problem and he goes to that church to find some literature, some help, he gets nothing. There's no literature about the pornography problem, nothing that tells him who the local counselors are or what they can do to solve that problem. And the man's suffering with his work. He's suffering with his marriage. He's, he looks on women every place he goes in a way that he shouldn't, but he wants help. Shouldn't the church be the first place that you could get help? But here in America, it isn't. Hey, you know, the pastors, if they're not hooked on it themselves, are afraid to talk about it because they're afraid they'll offend the men. Mm. And some of the women, you know, more women are being involved in pornography because their husbands are pulling them into it. They are. That's right. But if they if they would talk about it, and it, I realize it's hard for a pastor who's got a pornography problem to be talking about it, but I don't think that excuses them from having a a men's group where you bring in a speaker oh, once a year. Absolutely not. Uh, but there are these organizations that are out there. And there are counselors who know how to deal with it. Uh, You and I have a friend, Dr. Jerry Kirk. Yes. And Jerry is another one who grabbed hold of this issue uh, in the 80s. He came to our commission. He was pastor of College Hill Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati. And he fought it there in Cincinnati to a standstill. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's a hero of mine. Yes. He's accomplished a lot. There's the old guard. I'm pleased to be part of that old guard 30 years in this work. But there's a new guard, too. You'd be surprised, Jim, how many young people are standing up to this. I could have 500 interns every summer from college campuses. When we put the word out that we're looking for interns, we are overwhelmed. People want to be working on this. And frankly, it's particularly the women who don't like the college culture of exploitation that they're expected to fit into, and they want to do something about it. And I'm always pleased when we see these young men who apply, and they come, and we've got one now, working on these issues. So the young aren't necessarily all buying into this culture. They know there's something wrong, and many are willing to stand up. How can they reach you, Pat? At our website, which is endsexualexploitation.org. All right, we're going to do another program. We're going to talk right about that. Patrick, thanks for being here. Let's do it again tomorrow. Thank you, Jim. Boy, what a tough subject to hear about, but absolutely necessary to discuss and not sweep under the rug. 
As it says in Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. God certainly can move in our lives if we are honest with ourselves and open to hear him. And remember that the great Redeemer can cleanse anyone who comes to him seeking forgiveness with a repentant and contrite heart. Today's conversation was part one of a two-part discussion featuring today's guest, Patrick Truman, and our own Dr. James Dobson here on Family Talk. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to hear more from Patrick Truman and Dr. Dobson as they continue their discussion on the serious issue of pornography in the United States. I'm Roger Marsh. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Family Talk. I pray that God continues to bless you and your family as you continue to strengthen your walk in faith. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.